Game 73, Burnley vs Wolves on the 2nd of April 2024, titled Tone It Down. It is April's Fool's Day, a well-known day for practical jokes in England. But the email I received today is from the executive producer, and it goes through my heart like a hot knife through butter. He exclaims that tomorrow night's match needs to be on point as it will be available in the UK on the app. It is really important that all the goals in this game are nailed for highlights and distribution, so I'm going to need you to rein it in a bit and focus on getting the goals perfect. I deflate faster than a pricked balloon. Now I am different. I suppose I can be flippant during commentary as I'm often on the matches at the arse end of the Premier League. I haven't done them bad, but I'm aware I do things differently, including a comatose first half last weekend to a second half which was more frantic. I know Tom would have realised what the email would have done to me, so I think he thought long and hard before sending it. I might be old, but I am sensitive. Anyway, the rhythm of dum 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 da da dum dum goes through my head, and the word pressure is screaming up in my cranium as well. Nerves flow through my veins, concern of where the barometer of mirth is. He mentions in a later email he didn't want me to mention the place was swinging like Trevor and Simon's pants. You know, when I didn't have nerves in my playing days, I rarely played well. well most of my old teammates will possibly say you were never nervous then. But I can load pressure up on myself. I suppose it's my background when Pedo Pete used to destroy me in class in front of my mates. You always feel vulnerable and therefore almost exaggerate the pressure upon yourself. That is how I feel now. Am I good enough or are they tolerating this old chap or do they feel sorry for the old man who should have a carer with him? I can build angles for pressure from anything. A look, a raised eyebrow, banter. The email has put me in a darkish place continually questioning what I should say and what I shouldn't say. The journey passes quickly and I wander down Baker Street. No, I'm not going to do that again. I arrive at the studio buzzing like a child who's had too much sugar. I felt I needed to get the energy out to drop to a lower level. So I talked to Ryan, another commentator who was making his way up in the game and doing well. Sadly, he gets a full all-out joke 20 minute routine from me in an effort to knacker myself out and drop to a somber Radio 4 continuity announcer level. But he's laughing as I cannot shake my obvious anecdotal puntastic lineage. Trying to force myself to be good, I commentate aloud in my best BBC voice. Hello and welcome to this fine football association match between Burnley from the north and Wolverhampton Wanderers from the Midlands. Before cutting to some fake commentary. What a fine ball that is! He's in on goal! Fafana has twatted it into the back of the net. Before realising I can't take this too seriously and mentally berating myself. My pulse rate eventually drops and the sugar rush wears off. I hadn't had any. I pull myself together and settle into trying to give a flawless performance and a performance that suppresses my inner kid. Let me be fair here, I don't do a gagathon commentary, but if there's anything whimsical that needs addressing, I tend to do it. I tend to think, why not? I am the eyes of the listener and I'm not talking about global tensions or politics, but a game of football. Maybe my analogies are cultural in terms of age ranges listening, or countries around the world, but that is me. Remember, you help some people some of the time, but not all of the people all of the time. The mere mention of it being Burnley versus Wolves should see me drop off into a torpor anyway. But no, I love this gig or these gigs. The application of personal pressure sees me go into anxiety mood prior to kickoff. My mind screams there's a whole new audience that you can entertain. But if you can get the swing joke in, you're on your way. Swing gag, I hear you say. Credit Mike Buxton for this one. I was walking down the road minding my own business without a care in the world when a bloke came round the corner and asked if I minded giving him a push. I followed him round the corner only to find him sitting on a swing. Love that gag, right on point for my mind. Anyway, I'm not going to do it in my commentary unless there's sufficient evidence and context to allow me to insert said gag. By that I mean there won't be. Anyway, football. It surprises me and it's a good game. A sumptuous cross from O'Shea and a caressing right foot half volley from Brun Larsen gives Burnley the lead before a delicious free kick delivery allows the impressive Ike Norrie to head in the equaliser. 
the second half sees Jose or Jose Sar make saves before Aitnori brings out the best from the Burnley keeper Murić. Lamina grazes a post with a diving header and it ends in a draw and I hope I have an acceptable under pressure commentary under my belt. The goals felt fine, descriptive comms on point. You see, I knew I could do it. I do believe in my own ability occasionally. All that nervous energy has left me a little knackered on the cross London and home journey. But the lifting of the dissipation of the self-imposed stress levels leaves me looking out at the darkness on the train home. Why that pop group was outside the train window, I don't know, but they were. See, if the door is slightly open, I will go through it. In a way, I love mucking about. Leave a line open and I will fill my boots. My sister-in-law feels I have a little bit of Lee Mack in me, and I'm not into that sort of thing. See, word it right and you can't do anything. Word it wrong and there is always a place for a double entendre. Is it because people are lazy with phrases or simply I have a mucky mind or maybe I get bored with their conversation? I will let you decide. Anyway, my wife picks me up at the station and puts me down and then drives me home. Night night. Game 74, Luton versus Bournemouth on the 6th of April 2024. Titled The Late Late Luton Show. Talksport and another Saturday journey to London. Another seat and another filled train by High Wickham and another set of gyrating groins standing at eye level in the gangway. My two-seater seat on the train does have a window, allowing me the luxury to avert my gaze from around the carriage. Someone finally takes a plunge and sits next to me and we have a little chat, nothing major but very convivial. The train arrives at Marlebone and it takes a fair few minutes before I can get up, straighten out and pop my bag on and ready myself for the little trot down to Baker Street Station. It is interesting at Marlebone because as you leave the station through the main thoroughfare, it is similar to coming out of the old television show Stars in Their Eyes. All the smokers stand just outside the door gaffing off their cigarettes before heading into the station. So I emerge with the words, Tonight, Matthew, I'm going to be coughing. I have never smoked in my life. When I was at home, my mum and dad smoked and so did my brothers. Me and Elsa the Labrador didn't. For me, it isn't the lit cigarette smell I dislike, but the ashtray with the dog ends that I detested. A cigarette butt with lip spittle on the end in cold ash. Anyway, as strange as I am, I understand people who do smoke as being addicted and I feel for them. What I cannot understand is 15 or 16 year olds coming out of school and sparking up. There are enough reasons out there not to. Hey ho, I'm addicted to eating, but having said that, I was only about 30 minutes old when I was being force fed. See, I had no chance. I knew from an early age I was going to put weight on. There was no way I was going to stay £7.3 ounces. So I walked down towards Baker Street with a variety of smells filling the air. Cigarette smoke, occasionally cigar smoke, sometimes a pipe, and more often than not these days a pungent aroma of wild gooseberries and blackcurrant vapour, with a soup son added in of diesel petrol entwined plus food aromas. I think that nails it. The sky is laden with high grey clouds and it's a wee bit muggy in terms of what to wear. I think I've possibly got the wrong combination of upper torso clothing on. There is some perspiration knocking about. At Baker Street and onto the Jubilee Line platform for Stratford, I wander right to the end of the tube train when it arrives. I glance up at the digital board and one should be here in three minutes. It is fairly empty as I stop on the platform. But as per normal, those three minutes elapse and the platform duly fills up. Disappointingly, people start standing around me. No issue there, but there is no etiquette in London. As soon as a tube arrives, the you were here before me etiquette totally evaporates into a free-for-all. I decide a full lurch to my left, dropping the point of my shoulder in close proximity to the person encroaching on my left. This stops the said left-hand encroachment, but blindside right, I've left a gaping opening, therefore reducing the chances of getting a seat on an already populated train. I drop a quick right shoulder knowing I've delayed the left-hand side encroachment in an attempt to force the right-hand side to go right in the carriage, leaving me the left-hand side of the carriage for a single seat grasp. It works. I've sat in between two larger than normal persons whose buttocks on being seated have encroached onto my seat area. I am down and in for a few stops. 
I look around for something to look at or stare, but end up checking out shoes and socks as per normal. At London Bridge, the route march and escalator bottleneck ensues, and lo and behold, on the downside escalator right on my left, I catch the eye of someone looking at me. Was she entranced by my good looks? Did she find me irresistible? Did she smile knowingly? No, she didn't. She looked at me with utter contempt for looking at her. But she was already looking at me before our gaze met. I was annoyed. Yes, I wear a silly hat and have a big nose and ears, but you were looking at me, not the other way round. The obligatory coffee and people watching down on London Bridge Concourse before heading into the palatial surroundings of the office reception. Guessing right on the way out of the lifts and into the studios where the early kickoff is well underway. And there's a little light-hearted banter between fellow commentators. Now I'm not sure I've told you this already in the other 83,000 words I've spoken in your local hold, but at the bottom end of the Premier League I find it infinitely more exciting than the usual two or three horse race for the title. Luton and Bournemouth represented a game of intrigue. Luton's needs were more pressing than mid-table Bournemouth, but recently they have played their rearranged game, which was abandoned after Tom Lockyer's heart attack on the pitch at the Vitality. That game saw Luton go three up before Bournemouth scored four to win 4-3. So there was a little backstory to this one. There's a little bit of chat with Johnny H, Douglas and the Batchmeister, and I'm checking that in my head possible commentators' podcast thoughts, because I feel there's a lot of commentator bollocks that people would find amusing when you add in maybe Rysus and the Drabmeister as well. But that is for another day. Too many ideas. My bowels rumble, so I head off for the cubicles for a four-finger poo, also known as a quick crap. I didn't really, I just put that in for a gag. Mind you, if anyone does ever follow me into the toilets, they would have gagged. Luton versus Bournemouth, and Bournemouth go carpentry style. They are undertaking woodwork lessons when Tavernier and Cliver hit the frame of the Luton goal. Morris then threatens a Bournemouth goal before Tavernier scores for the Cherries with a sweet left foot strike. But here is the title. Jordan Clark makes the most of a delightful break of the ball to sweep in the equaliser late on before Woodrow crosses on 90 minutes, which sees Colton Morris redirect the ball in via his instep on the volley for a Luton win. Exactly what the Hatters need and slightly against the runner play. I wander down to the tube platform at London Bridge and it's busy. And I walk along the platform to find ample space where the crowded platform has thinned somewhat, allowing me the possibility of getting a seat. A quick glance at the arrivals board shows one in a minute and one in three minutes. As I glance down, I'm now getting surrounded by persons who have also got to the thinned out part of the packed platform. And under my breath, I'm slightly angrily swearing at for no other reasons than I am thinking, why stand here? They can do whatever they want, really. But the train comes in from my left and it's packed. I make a quick decision to drop a shoulder as if I'm desperate to get on. This platform dummy is sold to the persons around me and they crowd the sliding doors. But what they don't know is I've pulled a flanker as I pull back allowing them the personal satisfactory mental win as they board the overcrowded tube ahead of me. I know there is another one in a moment which will be emptier and I've traded on their tube aggression to secure a seat. Those affected peer out of the closed doors at me now wondering why I didn't get on. I smile knowingly, they get to sniff people's armpits in a tight, warm, overcrowded space while I hope I get a seat. Hey, and I do get a seat, and they realise what a pernickety, angry, mental man I am. But at least my knees are spared and my nostrils are free from body odour. Off of Baker Street, across to the Bakerloo line, and on one stop to Marleybone. Up the stairs and escalator before grabbing a coffee and waiting for the train to come up on the board for alighting. It's on two, and I'm hobbling with pace towards the front end of the train. Seat secured, and normal routine followed. Check this, check that, check the other. Think about home, think about the next commentary, and think about having a little flutter on the GGs on the way home. Open the phone, look at the race cards before seeing the warnings about gambling, and then realise how easy it is to do, and how easy it is to gamble amounts you wouldn't necessarily gamble, and by that I wouldn't normally have more than a five on a horse, but by the app, you could say stick on 20 and not realize it. So maybe betting apps should be banned. Make someone go out of their way to place a bet. Make them go to a betting shop. That way it might just make people think about gambling more and therefore they wouldn't bet willy-nilly. Just a thought, 
The trouble is the revenue made by the government. It's a bit like Siggy's. It is a drain on the NHS, but the revenue made is astonishing. I have a bet and managed to double my money on the train, so the train fare is now covered before arriving home and the comforts of a reclining settee. I am that old now that when I settle down I don't want to budge. It's a Saturday night and many moons ago there was a prime time TV show called The Late Late Breakfast Show. Today it is a Saturday and I reflect again, but on The Late Late Luton Show, before heading up the wooden hills to Bedfordshire.